Praise the Lord. It's awesome to be in His house on His appointed times. Here to praise and worship Him and show our love and obedience. Let's start off in Deuteronomy 16. We'll go ahead and start in verse 9. The first few verses there talks about the appointed times and unleavened bread. And then it goes into verse 9. You shall count seven weeks for yourself. You shall begin to count seven weeks from the time you begin to put the sickle to the standing grain. And then you shall celebrate the feast of weeks to the Lord your God with a tribute of a free will offering of your hand, which you shall give just as the Lord your God blesses you. And you shall rejoice before the Lord your God and your son, you and your son and your daughter and your male and female servants, the Levite who is in your town and the stranger and the orphan, the widow who is in your midst in a place where the Lord your God chooses to establish his name. We're to come before him on his appointed times with an offering. And it's not always about the amount. Now, if you feel or you're moved to do the, a certain amount, that's fine. That's between you and the Lord. Or if He moves you to, we've seen that on rare occasion where He'll move a certain person to give X and they'll offer that. But the Lord looks at the intent of the heart. That's the reason that Abel's offering was being received and Cain's wasn't. is because the motivation in Cain's heart, he didn't truly submit to the Lord with the right attitude. He didn't truly love his brother before he even raised his hand to kill him. He was already jealous. Oh, well, he already kind of went with the whole idea. You can see it through the actions that my offering is not going to be received anyway. So here you go. Here's what I got. Here, take it. And that's not the right motivation. You know, I'm not the only one here and probably not the only one out there that may ever watch this that knows that we can't outgive the Lord. There's no way. We could serve flawlessly, if at all possible, the rest of our lives, however many years that is, and we can't match Him. We can't. And then it's not enough that He paid the price and He served us with His body being torn to shreds for healing and all the other many blessings that He walked out. When we get up there, He's going to serve us at table. He's going to serve us even when we're up there. And it, to us, it feels, or I, know, I know to me, it feels backwards. It feels like you've given enough, but it blesses His heart. He rejoices in the fact He's able to love on His children. And it blesses even, even more when out of a reciprocal love, we can give what we are able to give with a pure heart and say, Here, Lord, I know that You own everything. This is just a, a small stipend of whatever it is. If it's service to a brother or service to people out here or on a holy day you're giving an offering, one thing... Let's turn over to Matthew chapter 5, the Sermon on the Mount. His first instructions before he actually kicked in his full ministry on this earth. Verse 23 says, If you therefore pre presenting in your offering at the altar and there remember your brother has something against you, leave your offering there before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and present your offering. It's not merely, it doesn't say here, merely if you have a problem with your brother, but if you realize there's a problem your brother has with you, if you've done something or he, they appear, that it has appeared that you've done something to offend them, you restore it, you make it right, you have a pure heart before God. You don't wanna be having some sort of underlying stigma there in the body of Christ because we're all one body. Well, just like we're to have a right attitude with our Heavenly Father. Skip down to chapter 6, starting in verse 1. So many times, it kind of, it's kind of awkward up here, and I know I'm not the only one when you give an offertory, because you see out here, you know, so many people say, give me your money, give me your money, give me your money. If you'll do this, the Lord will bless you. And not saying that the Lord won't bless you if you give an offering, but it's a push. They just want finances. You can tell. That's the main reason. So, you know, I always think if somebody's just scamming through YouTube videos and they see an offertory message, oh, see, that church wants money too. They don't sit there and immediately look at the, you know, the whole thing. But there's only certain times that God commands us not to enter in before Him empty-handed. 
You know, on weekly Sabbaths, we have tithes and offerings, and, and that's just merely free will if you feel led, the offering there. But on the, the appointed times, the holy days that he set apart, when I was a kid, I'd read Adam and Eve, and I thought, man, that would be awesome to know that God set a certain point of time up just to hang out with me, just to love on me and let me love back on him. And the whole time, I didn't know he did. You know, he has a weekly Sabbath, and then he also has appointed times that he set from creation to be with his family, to love on us. It blesses me, the, the meaning of tabernacles, you know, whatever we're doing is a blessing to him. Whether we're playing a game or whatever, you know, when it, the days that aren't actually sanctioned as the first and last great day, you know, or holy days, just like the Sabbath, high holy days. But the rest of the week is like, it doesn't matter what you're doing. It's a pleasure to him. He's just rejoicing over the fact his children are, are loving on each other and having fun, feeding our faces, which are a blessing to all of us, or whatever it may be. I had to go there, David. Me and you have kindred hearts. Verse 1 of chapter 6. Beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. When, you, when therefore you give alms, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets that they may be honored by men. Truly I say to you, they will have their reward in full. But when you give alms, do not lift, let your left hand know what your right hand's doing, that your alms may be in secret and that your father who sees in secret will repay you. And it all goes further into prayer all of our in fasting, we're to not appear all mope with covered in ashes, so everybody knows, because it's between us and the Lord. It's it's an intimate moment. We're not to do it for oh look how holy I am. I'm fasting and you're not, or I'm praying like that. It goes further where the guys, you know, I'm glad I'm not like Joe over here. Well, Joe's actually repenting over here, or whatever the guy's name is. You know, he's truly saw that he is in his own righteousness he's filthy rags that he deserves you, you know when you say oh well i don't deserve that yeah yeah we do we deserve a whole lot more than god has been merciful to, even when we're outside of him god's been merciful not to give us what we deserve and he didn't deserve one thing that was done to him he came down in love and at the hands of the very ones he came to save he got dealt the most wicked, cruel hand possible from childhood on up to the crucifixion. He didn't deserve a thing, and you never see that kind of attitude in him. You never see whenever he's asleep trying to get a little bit of rest and the disciples wake him up because they don't have that the faith has been shaken and they're, and they're kind of feeling sorry for themselves. He gets up and says, where's your faith? But then he handles the problem. He solves the problem. He takes the fear away from them. That is the kind of loving father we have. We, we need to at least attempt in our lives, whether it be a gift on a holy day or, or, or throughout the week or whatever it is, to always have His heart because that's what's going to lead us not astray. So, so many variables and the enemy can get us off just a little bit where we don't notice it and it's off track. It doesn't matter how little we're off track or how we got there, whether it was malicious or accidental on our part, the fact is we're off track. And we need to follow so many times in Scripture we see where he says, if you want to be Christ's disciples, you follow, walk as he walked, very intently, very carefully. You watch and see how he walked. If I'm trying to, if Michael's going across a lake that's frozen and there's weak spots, and he says, follow me, and I'll find the solid spots, if I'm not carefully watching where he puts his feet, I'm probably going to step in a hole. I'm going to find that weak spot i got to carefully say, well, he stepped here and he did it this way and follow suit. It's the same way and even more so with the Lord. Mark chapter 13. It would help if I turned to the right book. Well, obviously, I wrote down the wrong scripture. Well, let's just go over to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians, I wrote down the incorrect scripture. Chapter 9. Verse 
verse 5. So I thought it necessary to urge the brethren that they would go on ahead to arrange beforehand you pre what you previously promised, a bountiful gift, that the same might be ready as a bountiful gift and not to be affected by covetousness. Now I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully shall also reap bountifully. Let each one do just as he is purposed in his heart, not grudgingly, or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful, cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, that always having all sufficiency in everything, you may have an abundance for every good deed. You know, the widow's might was a story of the same thing. She didn't have much. She had, I think it was two, basically two pennies to her name. And everybody was looking and Jesus was watching that was the one thing people may not catch in that whole reference there Jesus was intently watching everyone giving their offerings and in the manner in which they were giving it the disciples well, well who's given the greatest offer and they're thinking well he obviously had more money so that's a greater offering and of course they were doing like it says not to do blowing trumpets and oh here I am I'm so holy and she just slid in there and dropped her two coins in there and Jesus pointed it out he said you know, she has given more out of her poverty than all of them and did it with a pure heart because she gave God everything she had and she didn't do it begrudgingly. It reminds me of when, I think it was Elijah or Elisha that was with the widow and she only had so much and he said, you give me all you have. And she didn't, she didn't hesitate. She gave him all, knowing that, hey, we're not gonna have a meal this afternoon my, my kid's almost starving to death anyway. And in the process, she couldn't get enough. It just kept overflowing until the right measure was met out. And then she had surplus for all three of them for the rest of the year. That's the kind of love that our Heavenly Father has. A caution, Acts 5, chapter 5. And we'll close. God, the Lord looks at the heart. David went so far outside the parameters of God's power, presence, and His Word. And from a naive, immature standard, you thought, well, that's showing favoritism because he only gave Saul the one opportunity and then it was blown. And then David, and he did this and this and this and this and worse and worse and worse until it was a stigma to all Israel and he gets the chance to reprieve himself. But when you look at it, the truth, God always knew the difference between their hearts. Saul was never going to please God. He was never striving after that. He was striving after pleasing mankind. And if he gave him the chance, he's, the next time he's going to please the people. People say, oh, well, what about this? Well, he's going to please the people. David, he went so far off track because once you get grappled by sin, it locks you down. But God always knew, all i got to do is get his attention and he's going to repent because he has a heart after me. It may be covered with pain. It may be covered with hurt. It may be covered with whatever it is in our lives. Each person has something different that bogs them down and they don't even realize when it's happening until it's already there to separate them from the love and, and the way of the Lord. But we need to have ingrained in us now the heart after the Lord to the point whenever someone says, hey, John, you're out of line. I don't get mad and I don't throw a fit and I don't go, yeah, will it hurt? Yeah, will it possibly make me angry? Briefly. But if I have the heart of the Lord, it will convict me. And I won't be like Judas or Saul where I just basically bust hell wide open with my attitude towards God. But that I will realize, hey, I have sinned against you, Lord. Restore me, please. Don't, you know, Psalms 51, he said, don't take your Holy Spirit. He was begging him. Because he knew it was possible. He saw it with Saul, who he, who he loved even when Saul was chasing him. Don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Don't separate me from your presence. Let me be restored. Acts 5, starting in verse 1. But a certain man named Ananias with his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property and kept back some of the price for himself with the wife's full knowledge and bringing a portion of it, he laid it at the apostles' feet. 
But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back some of the price of the land? Now notice verse 4. While it remained unsold, did it not remain in your own? And after it was sold, was it not under your control? Why is it that you have conceived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. The purpose of what he was doing here was to appear holy and righteous to everyone around, saying, I sold everything I had and I gave it. When the truth of the matter was, he didn't. He was keeping back. He was being selfish. At no time God said, you sell everything you have and give it to me. Not in this instance. He has done that. He's told you know the young rich ruler, give everything you have and follow after me, and he couldn't do it. He went away sorrowful. But he didn't do this with Ananias. It wasn't a command. That's why he said, while it was yours, was it not under your control? And when you got the money, you could have said, well, Lord, I'm only going to give so much and not put on the heirs that I sold everything and gave it. The heart. The heart. He wasn't worried about the amount because it was up to Judas, or Ananias' choice right there. And Sapphira went along with it. Verse 5, And as he heard these words, Ananias fell down and breathed his last, and great fear came upon all who heard it. And then it goes on with the wife. The wife did the very same thing. She fell down. It was to establish fear and respect of the Lord. Don't play these games with the Lord whenever you're, you're, you're putting on airs. Because who knows when that time's going to come, when it will be used as an example. Not only how much hurt and damage you're doing to the Lord, that's the most important thing. He didn't ask for everything we all have to be laid down at one physical moment. He may at some point. Now with our walk, yeah, we're to give up our flesh and our carnal way of life to follow Him. We've counted the cross. If He said, John, sell everything, go do this, and I knew it was the Lord. And you need to weigh that because there's spirits involved. I should do it with a cheerful heart. If I don't, I'm a miss. So when we get up and here in a minute, the song will play, the children will come first, then the adults. Let us evaluate our heart. Let us not be begrudging to the Holy Spirit. If it's little or, or great, whatever it is, whatever we purposed in our heart, let us praise God with our blessings. Please.